10 heures du matin. The doors open at 10 o'clock to let the visitors in. Scholars, architects, archaeologists, painters and sculptors, students, and of course, tourists. From India, from Portugal, Americans, Japanese, Arabians, Greeks, Italians, and even freshmen. About two million people a year come to the Louvre. From the ends of the earth, they come here. Why? For one simple reason, to see the world's greatest collection of art. But the Frenchman, well, the Frenchman comes here for two reasons. To see the art, of course, but also because every Frenchman has a passion for the Louvre. That is, for the building itself. He loves to walk on the same floors where 50 kings and queens of France have walked. Great artists and emperors have lived in the Louvre, revolutionaries and princes, poets and priests, even a pope. All have lived in this building, have died here in great regal beds, or been killed here with their boots on. On your first visit to the Louvre, I would suggest you come with a Frenchman. He will show you that even on the roof, there is a chronicle of French history. the kings and queens, and the poets and the politicians. The Louvre is in the very center of Paris. The great landmarks of the city spread in a perfect circle around us. The Sacré Coeur on top of Montmartre, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the Opera, the Eiffel Tower. And straight up the Champs-Élysées, to its very top, the Arc de Triomphe. The Louvre has always been in the center of Paris. That is to say, it has been the heart of Paris for almost 800 years. Here is Paris today, and here is the Louvre. Here is Paris 200 years ago. There is the Louvre. Paris before the discovery of America. And this is the Louvre. Paris 600 years ago. And this is the Louvre. 700 years ago. And here is the Louvre. And Paris in the year 1190. It is necessary to go back that far to find a Paris without its Louvre. It was in that year that King Philip Augustus built himself a fortress, a place to keep his jewels, his dogs, and his prisoners of war. It was built so long ago that nobody knows where it got its name. What does Le Louvre mean? Nobody knows. It was built so long ago that there is nothing left of it. Nothing that is to say 
above the ground. But if you look in the Cour Carré, uh, the square court of the Louvre, the court where the children play today, the circle in the pavement marks the exact place where Philip built that fortress eight centuries ago. Under that circle, under the museum today, the dungeon of Philip's fortress still exists. Here is where prisoners were chained and tortured. It is possible lepers were kept here, and the word Louvre may come from the old French word for leper. And here, possibly, uh, Philip kept dogs to hunt wolves. Uh, such a kennel was called a louveterie. Le Louvre. What a poetic word to descend from such meanings. The kings who followed Philip uh, changed his fortress into a palace, which is quite a different thing. For 350 years, they added pretty towers and elaborate rooms as their pleasures became more elaborate. Until there came an elaborate king who tore the palace down. Francis I was born two years after the first voyage of Columbus the first royal specimen of the Renaissance man in France. Great linguist, great tennis player, lover of hunting, lover of masquerade parties, great lover. But the important fact about this man is that he was a lover of art. He had his portrait painted by none other than Titian because he had a great admiration for the Italian school of painters. He bought paintings by the most popular contemporary painter in Italy, Raphael, the Holy Family. Joan of Aragon. Another Italian painter, one who felt that his unique talents were not being properly appreciated by his countrymen, was persuaded by Francis to come and live in France. And legend has it that he died in the arms of Francis. He was called Leonardo da Vinci. After the death of the artist, Francis purchased several paintings from da Vinci's studio. Da Vinci called it the Virgin, the Child, and Saint Anne. What Da Vinci called this one, nobody knows. Henry II, son of Francis I. He rebuilt what his father had destroyed. But Henry, had no great devotion for the pure Italian style. All his life, he would favor the embellishments of the French Renaissance. The edge says, I, Henry II, built this. The two Ds above stand for Diana. Henry II inherited his father's appetites, but not his palate. Presented with two works by an Italian sculptor, named uh, Michelangelo, he promptly gave them away. He seemed always to prefer the work of French sculptors, particularly when they carved his favorite subject, Diana. Or, more properly, Diane. Perhaps Henry did not like Italian art because he was married to an Italian. He married Catherine de' Medici when he was 14. When Henry was 17, he met a French noblewoman, Diane de Poitiers. She was in her 30s and a widow. For the next 20 years, until his death, under Catherine's eyes, in her presence, Henry and Diane were inseparable. His mistress raised one child for him. His wife, Ten.
but it was his love for Diane which he proclaimed all over the Louvre. It is not Diana the goddess, he advertises, it is Diane, the mistress. The wife decided to build a palace of her own, on the other side of the city wall, far, far away from all those Dianas. It was called the Tuileries, a name we associate with some of the most glorious, some of the most grotesque events in the history of France. much of the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre of the Huguenots took place. In the courtyard of the Louvre, in the garden of the Tuileries. It was Catherine's wish to join the two palaces with one incredibly long gallery. Death denied her a dream. It remained for a marvelous son-in-law to make it come true. Henry IV, king, soldier, diplomat, builder. During his reign, it took 13 years to build the most spectacular segment of the Louvre, the Grand Gallery, 950 feet of splendid passageway. It was so big, Henry sometimes had it filled with trees and birds and dogs. And then he hunted a fox, in here, on horseback, for the amusement of his young son. The ivory hand, a symbol of the throne, which can be seen in the Louvre today, was beside Henry on his deathbed. After his death, his queen, Mary de' Medici, issued an order to the Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubens, glorify me and my late husband in a series of paintings depicting my glorious career and his. One of the most dazzling and ingenious achievements in the whole history of art. To make a dull woman's dull life seem exciting. He put her everywhere in the company of gods and heroes and saints, all paying homage to Mary de Medici. There are 21 giant paintings. It took Rubens three years to paint them all. One of them, Mary did not like, so Rubens painted this one in three weeks. The son of glorious Mary de' Medici was Louis XIII. History remembers him mainly for two accomplishments. First, he continued the royal tradition of improving the Louvre. He removed the Great Wall of Paris because the city was bursting at the boundaries. The Louvre in the 17th century was in the center of a growing, uncontrollable Paris. The main sewer of the city was the Seine itself. And in the summertime, when the stink was too much for prestigious royal noses, it was the habit of royalty to retreat to the country. One day, while Louis XIII was on just such a trip to the country, a great thunderstorm came up, and Louis was forced to turn back home to the Louvre. In those days, royalty traveled with its own furniture. Louis' bed had already been sent ahead. There was no royal bed left in the Louvre, except uh, the bed of his usually neglected wife, Anne of Austria. And nine months later, 
we may credit Louis XIII with the second of his great accomplishments, Louis XIV. Messieurs, le roi. The Sun King, he was called. He came to the throne when he was five years old. He sat there for 72 years, the longest recorded reign in history. He was glorified here as a patron of the arts. To celebrate the birth of his first legitimate son, Louis organized the most splendid festival the Louvre has ever known. And it was held in the courtyard of the Louvre, which to this day is known as Cours du Carousel. On any carousel, the lucky rider catches the gold ring. And the Sun King himself, with typical show of modesty, appeared in the costume of a mere Roman emperor. Louis lived in the Louvre for 17 years. In that time, he finished the Cour Carré, the square court. But the finest thing Louis ever did for the Louvre was what he did to the outside of the Cour Carré, the colonnade. I, Louis, built this. In this room in the Louvre, the room of the Cariatide, Moliere first performed this play, The Amorous Doctor, for the King. Moliere wrote ballets for the King, which were danced in this room. bestowed upon the playwright Molière the most magnanimous of all personal favors. He died with it. And the great patron of the arts did not neglect the art of painting. From all the schools of Europe, he bought and bought and bought. Karachi, Titian. Rembrandt, Caravaggio, Giorgione, must have admired Van Dyck's portrait of Charles I. Its kingly pose, the thrust of the elbow, the placement of the feet. The same position of the feet, the same elbow, appears in Rigaud's portrait of Louis. The great patron supported six palaces in his lifetime, 10,000 attendants in one palace alone. His lifelong infatuation with art, architecture, and with himself bankrupted the treasury of France. Exactly 76 years and two kings after Louis, the deluge. 
It was here, in the Cour du Carousel of the Louvre, that the first guillotine of the French Revolution was set up. On the 27th of May, 1792, the National Assembly announced that this palace of kings would henceforth belong to the public, would henceforth be a public museum. And thus it was for six years. Until a new landlord moved into the Louvre. David painted him in the Louvre, the only portrait Napoleon ever posed for. Napoleon made additions to the outside of the building. In the Cour du Carousel, he built the Arc du Carousel. The first sculptured horses placed on this arch were taken from the church of Saint Marco in Venice. Napoleon decorated the Louvre in a manner approached by no man before or since and filled it with the finest works of art that the rest of Europe could provide. Thousands of tons of art sent to Paris from palaces, libraries and cathedrals of all conquered nations. When the Musée Napoleon, yes, he changed its name, was decorated to his satisfaction and the Grand Gallery was filled uh, with his artistic conquests, Napoleon decided it was ready for his marriage to Marie Louise. The Napoleonic splendor of the Louvre lasted for 12 years. It lasted until Waterloo. To Napoleon, every work of genius must belong to France. It was a point of view not wholeheartedly shared by the Germans, Italians, Spanish, and Dutch. After Bonaparte's defeat, they came to the Louvre to take back their treasures. It is a tribute to French diplomacy, French tenacity, and French persuasion that many of Napoleon's acquisitions remained in the Louvre. The Virgin and Child of Cimabue, the first painter to give a human look to saints and angels 700 years ago. The Coronation of the Virgin by Fra Angelico, 500 years old, and its colors as fresh today as the day they were painted. The Visitation by Ghirlandaio. Calvary by Mantegna, the sculptor in paint. Other paintings remained because Napoleon had bought them, like the Moneylander by Quentin Metzis, who painted common people and their common desires. Marvelous things remained, and perhaps the most marvelous of all was a tradition. Since Napoleon, the French zeal to hunt for treasures of the past has never abated. Ambassadors of France have caught the fever of archaeology, and what was found in the earth of Egypt, Assyria, Italy, Greece, Persia, Babylon, they sent back to the Louvre. This one, from Egypt, is 4,500 years old. Mm -hmm. 
Napoleon III. He became emperor because he was ambitious, indomitable, and the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He and his empress Eugenie were married in the Louvre. They were the greatest builders the Louvre has ever known. They did more building here in five years than all their predecessors had done in 700. Because he thought the Grand Gallery of Henry IV was not wide enough, not sumptuous enough, he tore down a large part of it and rebuilt it. It was left to Napoleon III to finally complete the grand design that had been conceived three centuries earlier. When it was finished, it was a scene of splendid royal festivities. was the keynote of everything built by Napoleon III. Blazing Baroque richness to show the world how rich was the French nation. The French taste. The French way of life. Richness was the keynote of French fashion. Exemplified by the Empress herself. But the Emperor forgot French restlessness. On the 4th of September, 1870, the Communards attacked the Louvre. The Empress Eugenie was forced to flee. She had to run the entire length of the Louvre to escape the mob. While she was finding sanctuary, the Tuileries Palace was being consumed in flames. palace, built by Catherine de' Medici, was completely gutted. For 12 years, Paris looked on these unsightly stones, while the Chamber of Deputies argued whether to rebuild it or to remove it entirely. It was decided to remove it, so that when the Louvre moved into the 20th century, it would be more of a living part of the city than it had ever been before. Its windows would open on a colossal perspective along a way of glory. Its gardens would become one great park, one great playground, one great parade ground. They paraded down the Champs Elysees, across the Place de la Concorde, across the Tuileries Gardens into the Louvre, expecting to find there the greatest collection of art treasures in all the world. They found nothing, 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 nothing. Months before the last war, while the heads of Europe were busily guaranteeing peace in our time, Certain realistic Frenchmen were taking no chances. Let the politicians carry on the discussions about peace, they said. We have work to do. We must empty the Louvre on the still small chance that there will be a war. And so, in one of the great evacuations of history, one of the most successful of all strategic retreats, in a miracle of packing and creating and moving, they emptied the Louvre of its most precious possessions, and they hid them in secret places all over the country, in chateaus, in cellars, in caves, in mines, in private homes. They hid them. 
Even as, later on, so many Frenchmen were to hide their children. So successfully was everything protected that in the long years of German occupation, while the expert ferrets of Hermann Goering were tracking down everything of artistic value everywhere in Europe, they never got one of the treasures of the Louvre. Not one. And when the great calamity was over, all the treasures came back. They came back home. It has been said uh, that the Louvre is a golden prison. Every work of art in it is serving a life sentence. There are 300,000 of them. Every day at 5 o'clock, the museum guards announce closing time. The custom of the Louvre which goes back a long time. To many visitors it comes too soon. They must be persuaded to leave. And the process is called the sweep. From all the corners of the Louvre, the guards converge, sweeping everything before them. That is to say, everyone. And to the, the main entrance. Golden. And out. Of the millions and millions who have visited the Louvre, there must be many who leave with an identical dream. Enter that museum, alone, to possess the Louvre, all alone. To have all doors open for me, alone. To walk where I wish for a few selfish hours. King's ransoms are in this room. Napoleon fell in love with one of the ladies in this room for four years. He kept her in his bedroom. Rembrandt's Bathsheba, dreaming of King David. As his own years increased, Rembrandt turned more and more to the Bible with a palette of pure gold.
His countryman, Franz Hals, prefer the pagan laughter of bohemian girls. Madame Récamier was very beautiful, very rich, and very spoiled. Jacques David painted her hair light brown. Her hair was coal black, and she was proud of it. They disagreed, and he walked out. So, except for her face, the painting is unfinished. The Annunciation by Rogier van der Weyden, who was called the painter of the changes of the soul. The Virgin and Chancellor Rollin by Jan van Eyck, whose eye was so precise he could see the leaves on the trees a mile away and the soul in the face up close. Mother and child, one of the eternal themes of art. Botticelli's Marie Cassatt's Rembrandt's Rubens. Davids. The Spaniards. El Greco. Murillo. Ribera. From a distance, he looks like a happy child. At close, the title reads, Dwarf with a club foot by Rivera. The Frenchman Manet paints a happy child. Degas in one mood. In another. The ballet dancers were painted by Degas in his later years when he was almost blind. Renoir whose lights dazzle even in the gallery of the Impressionists. Cézanne. Vincent van Gogh. In a letter to Paul Gauguin, Van Gogh wrote, I have now done a portrait of Dr. Gachet, wearing the distressed expression typical of our times. 2,000 years separate Dr. Gachet from this portrait in stone of a Roman.
One slave, rebellious, the other resigned, the art of Michelangelo. Fifteen centuries old and under slaves, Venus de Milo, in the same golden prison, Le Louvre. In the final analysis, the greatest work of art of them all is the Louvre itself. So ancient in years, she has never shown her age. The stone is warm as life. Like every work of art, she continues to live. Unconquerable. Indestructible. Immortal.